Good evening and welcome to the British Library. Thank you so much for coming in. Welcome to everybody who's joining us online. You are in for such a treat. I just can't tell you the, the scale of radio legendariness that's about to take place. I've got no idea actually what they're going to do, but two things are for certain. One is that there will be Q&A, so please be ready for that. It's always my favourite bit. And two is that the book's on sale, so you'll be buying it afterwards. In the meantime, please enjoy and give a huge welcome to Jane, Fee and Anita. rather lovely. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm not surprised that you're all here and I know there are millions and millions of people joining us online as well. Um, we are in the company of greatness. I have to say greatness who, I mean I actually hate them both at the moment rather a lot. I'm barely speaking to either of them. Shall I, I mean Fee sent me pictures of her by a pool yesterday with her beautifully painted feet uh, looking rather lovely. She promised me she'd turn up with shit hair. Has she? Has she? No. Well, of course just, she hasn't. I've tied no. it up. No. And then when I was moaning and I said, oh, well, I'll just talk to Jane. I don't want to talk to you about tomorrow. I'm not even going to speak to you. Go away. Um, I'll talk to Jane. She's my favourite. And she said, well, that's nice. She's just come back from Seville. So I, I hate the pair of you. I, did you have a lovely time, though? Thank you. Did you have yes. a nice time? Was it good? <laughs> yes, it was. Do you find it easy to switch off when you go on holiday? Because you two are just so on the go all the time. <laughs> so busy aren't you? Absolutely. Um, well, I do find it very easy to, I mean, I'm not that busy. I, don't, I, know I, sh I shouldn't really say that when people have actually been kind enough to pay money to come out to hear us talk, but um, we're not as busy as you might think. We're certainly not as busy as you. Well, no, I know that, you know, I think you're actually ridiculously horsey modest. I know the things that you do. I don't, I, you don't you have packed so schedules, do you? No, not really. Unless you're doing work I don't know about, which is possible. No. Are you I doing stuff no. behind my back? No, I tell you everything, Jane. Yeah, I tell sure. you everything. But do you? Do you tell each other everything? Uh, there's quite a lot of my life that Jane knows about that I think she doesn't know about, but then it turns out she does know about. So, yeah, no, she knows about pretty does much. Does she know more about you than I do? Because I have to say, we are all three of us very good friends. I basically professionally stalked the pair of them throughout my career. So it was Five Live, first of all. I oh, know, but we do actually like you, Anita. Oh, they it's say not, that. Not oh, we might not by the end of this. No, no, no. You still, your hair is too good. I can't get over that. But anyway, so Five Live, um, Fee did a late night show, and then I stalked her into that role. And then Jane did Drive on Five Live, and I stalked her into that role when she left. And then they went and off to Radio 4, and I stalked them there as well. So, I mean, there could be a restraining order by the end of the evening. <laughs> frankly. Um, so you, you tell each other everything. This, the, the, sort of ra the podcast relationship, that is 2017, isn't it? Yes. It it's longer than all of my marriages put together. I like <laughs> to get that first. Uh, so we have, we have been podcast dating for five years. We have. Five years is a long time. It's a very long time, isn't it? Well, but the funny thing was, so before you think that this is some kind of terrible coven of uh, intricate friendship, um, Actually, Jane and I didn't know each other all that well when we started doing the podcast because uh, over at Five Live, it's a little bit like different sections of a library, isn't it? You, you would imagine it's all one great big kind of festival of fun. God knows it can be. <laughs> uh, but, but actually, the different shows mean that you don't often come across people uh, in real life. So we didn't really know each other until we did the radio festival together mm. in 20. 13? 13, I think. It was unlucky for some, but not for us, as it turned out. <laughs> um, and we actually discovered that we quite liked each other and we made each other laugh. And I always say, and I hate this aspect of being a woman sometimes, um, we had been slightly pitted against each other in broadcasting terms because we were both female, uh, slightly waspish brunettes. Short. Uh, short, that's mm. the bit I always forget. Um, and I think people just, I mean, I, it is true that some BBC managers honestly couldn't distinguish one from another. And they can't actually, I think when they heard that we were doing a podcast together, there was an element of what, there are two of them? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, no idea. And, but but the, there is a sort of awful truth at the heart of this, which is that women are, are too ready to compete against each other because there weren't that many of us and there, were, there are more of us now, which is brilliant. I mean, women are doing fantastic things in broadcasting and not just white women and high time, all that changed as well. Woohoo! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, I am aware. 
<laughs> I'm trying to be aware of Thank you very much. Janita. Yeah, no, no. I know you're always keeping me in check, <laughs> and rightly. Um, you know, that is important, obviously. Um, but we were, I think I was a bit scared of you. Oh, and don't I, be no, so was, silly. Why she, were you scared because of her? Because oh, was why? terribly sophisticated. She, she wore this. Note the past tense. <laughs> no, no, she, yeah, it's true. Well, now I know the truth. She'd worked at GLR, which was London. Some of you will have been very dedicated listeners to GLR. And it was so hip and so happening. And you had this wet look cat suit thing that you wore a lot. At the, I remember, you were notorious. <laughs> Whereas I'd done my local radio at BBC Hereford and Worcester, <laughs> where, you know, I'm, which is wonderful, but not quite in the same league. Um, so I had wellies and she had this, you know, this yeah. cat suit thing. Um, and she was just a bit more worldly and she's had twice as many husbands as me. And, you know, you know, it's, it's just genuinely, it's not fair. But I really regret that now and I, I hope it doesn't happen in, in that way now with, with sort of younger women in broadcasting as we were then, where they don't speak to each other because they're slightly worried that, frankly, the other one is after your job. I always really liked um, her. Did you? Yeah, well, <laughs> so you say, but there wasn't a lot of evidence to actually back that up. Oh, do you know, there's, um, uh, there's a Daily Mail quote about you. Uh, oh, I mean, God, that's not going to go well. Well, Actually, no, they really, no, surprisingly, they really liked you on this occasion. So, God, it's a, wrote this? Uh, in person, <laughs> as in on air, their style is uh, conversational. Jane is homely Thelma to Fee's more buccaneering <laughs> Louise. <laughs> homely. How do you feel about that? <laughs> well, do you know, it's, I've been called homely a lot, actually. Somebody else won, and I've never forgotten it. <laughs> Someone else described me as a homely blue stocking. <laughs> <laughs> so that's. Two homelies, one blue stocking, and what mm. was the other adjective? Well, Thelma and Louise, you know oh, how they ended up. Yeah, I know. Know. exactly, that wasn't well. good, was it? I know. I think you just um, need to, to stop the soup anecdotes. I am really. dull, but there's absolutely, you know, there's... <laughs> I'll take a certain amount of pride in that. No, I know, but please don't, you know, don't don't take the Daily Mail first. I mean, there is a dull is not a word that could ever apply to either of you. I mean, it, honestly, that it would be very easy to hate them, and I don't really. I love them both incredibly. Um, but the, the fastest wits. I mean, you'll hear this if you hear. Fortunately, you will know this, like lightning. And I resent you both deeply for this. You just managed to be there very, very quickly. And when you told me, and it was Fee told me first of all, that you were working on the book. I sort of went, yeah, let's see how you do that. <laughs> how does that work? Did you really think that, you miserable cow? <laughs> <laughs> I did. But anyway, so you, but, but you made it work. And what is wonderful, if you haven't read this book and it's on sale outside, please, please <laughs> get it outside. You don't it is, it is, it, No, you really should. It is, it's one of those things. So listening to their podcast has always reduced me to hysterics on a crowded tube, always. I mean, it's always at the most inopportune moment. I'm going, ah! And people, are, but the book did the same thing. It's laugh out loud funny, and what is beautiful about it is that we hear your voices. I mean, you've managed, you cracked it. We wrote it you, ourselves, Anita. But well, no, but you, <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't get, you didn't take on another voice for it. You kept completely who you are and how you speak. And yeah. it, how, how did you, you do it? I mean, well, first of all, were you intimidated by this idea of writing? It? Oh, I totally, because we are both massive book lovers aren't we yes and I look I've always wanted to write a book I've always wanted to be part of anything to do with writing a book and I've only written half a book and it was easily the hardest thing I've ever done but also one of the most satisfying things I've ever done and I didn't want to be I didn't want to be terrible at it but also I did find it hard to find my writey type voice because mm. I know what you mean some people they don't speak that way but they'll write in a way that's terribly sort of authorly Mm. And it's a, but it's, it's a like wearing grown-up pants. Yes, people put is, on their grown-up yeah. pants. But it's a little bit like yeah. people who go to Radio Four, and I did this myself. I went from Five Live, which has a brilliant conversational, mm. freewheeling style, and suddenly started adopting these affected pauses in my <laughs> sentences. And all this well, it's a whole different type of intonation. Do your story about, of course, which is my favourite thing. Oh, so well, you you must have noticed this. I, I presume many of you are Radio Four listeners, and you can share with the group. It's fine. We won't judge you. <laughs> But the, there's this thing at Radio 4, I, I don't think it happens as much as it used to, but when people were being introduced on air, there'd be this long kind of spiel about, you know, he was the former ambassador to the UN, who then took up his post as the world's most important pompous ass. <laughs> he is, of course, uh, Sir Buffington Tuffington. <laughs> and you're listening at home going, of course? I mean, I don't know. I don't know, Nick. <laughs> It might be, of course, to you, Mr. Yeah. Robinson, but it's not, of course, to all of us. But there is that kind of assumed 
knowledge, I think, at Radio 4, which can be incredibly intimidating to listen to, because that's the moment that you always switch off as a listener, you know, when somebody, uh, you know, is just kind of operating way above your level. You know, I'm at home kind of going, well, I don't care. You know, you're not talking to me. But when you're actually on air, it's about 250,000 times worse. So I think both you and I mm. uh, struggled with that, actually, when we joined, didn't yes, we? Well, I, th I would say arriving at Radio 4 as a presenter is a bit like deciding to set up home in a very remote Herefordshire village. Mm. <laughs> no previous knowledge of the locality whatsoever. <laughs> and sort of breezing in and assuming that you can take over the Women's Institute. And um, <laughs> okay, I have to tell you, you, you wouldn't do that, or you shouldn't do that. And it's not terribly welcoming, actually. No. Either well, you two, you two both had a hard time. Yeah. yeah. Well, did you yeah. not? Oh, well, I think you'd made it easier for me, actually. Uh, I, I'll be very honest. I mean, that's why I do follow you in your career, because you just you, you plough the furrow and I just trumps in. Um, but, but it was hard. I mean, there were... It's one of the things that I'd love you to read in a little while, because I think it's just a real treat to... And they both picked favorite chapters that they wrote which is really nice for me but it's it's something that you wrote about which is women judging women and would it be fair to say that at Radio 4 it was sometimes the women who were the most awful uh, to the newcomers Jane Garvey <laughs> I don't know actually I uh, no I think I think the men were worse do I, you yes I do I do actually because I well, how old were you when you joined? God. By the way, we love Radio 4, it's absolutely Well, marvelous. no, it's, it's tremendous because, because you made it lovely. <laughs> I mean, yes. lovely yeah. slip Welcome of, all, slip of a girl. all those managers who are watching online. It's oh, God, yes. Yeah. Oh, I didn't right. think about them. I forgot about them just for a second. Uh, They're not paid enough, in my view. How old were you when you, when uh, you joined the network? 40, 44. 44, okay. Yes, I was just a child, 44. So I think I was 32. Oh, God! Yes. On, on Radio 4? Yes. And I, I've, I've never genuinely in my career, and I hope it won't happen again because I'm as old as the bloody hills now, but I remember uh, feeling so intimidated, mainly because it was, a, it was a very alpha male newsroom and it was run by these huge silverback gorillas. Uh, that's how they would see themselves. And I definitely felt... Uh, I'd never felt an inadequacy as a woman in broadcasting actually until then because five live wasn't really like that God, but, but, is, but was is, that was that us being doing what women do <laughs> which is like mm, this is you know I, i've got to do more i've got to be more rather. yeah probably or them i mean i i, I always think of this anecdote um, uh, virginia bottomley once said it and she said she was asked to take on secretary of state for health i believe <clears throat> and the chief whip rang her up and said virginia we'd like you like you to take this brief and she goes oh god do you think I can? I mean, I haven't got that much experience. And the chief whip, and forgive my French, said, what the effing hell is wrong with you? No man half as qualified as you would ever dream of saying that. They'd say, yes, I'm starting right now. <laughs> so, I mean, there is perhaps a, a degree of that where, you know, all those hundreds of managers, you're wonderful, by the way. I'll just say this camera, I think you're great. But, you know, <laughs> they'd say, well, we didn't do anything. It's all yes. in your head kind yeah. of thing. So it might have been. But I think Jane's point's true as well, that because there, were, there just weren't as many women in broadcasting, there certainly weren't mentoring schemes or, no. uh, you know, WhatsApp groups, all the stuff that we have now, which is just intrinsic, actually, to success at work for both, you know, young women and young men, because the workplace is an odd, it's an odd thing to enter, you know, and I don't think you automatically know the ropes. Uh, as somewhere as big as the BBC as well, which feels like it has all these different rules and different ways of doing things, you know, it's and, and when you're out there actually facing the listeners, that is quite a pressured thing too, because you've got to get that bit right first, but all the stuff going on in the background may not be very helpful, and I just hope it is a bit more helpful now. Yeah. Should well, we crack some jokes in a minute? Well, I was just going to say, you, I mean, <laughs> you, two, you two made it look very easy, that's all. You made it sound very pleasurable, not, not as if it... What, was working at Radio at all? <laughs> well, just, just, just radio in general. I mean, one of, one of the lovely things, I think, um, is that you, you just... You were human. <laughs> you just sort of said, when you didn't know something, I don't get that, can you say it again? What's that? You know, which is lovely, because you sort of hold the hand of the listener, which is exactly there in your writing as well. Can we talk about the book? Let's. Let's do that. So how did it work? So who, who, how did it all start? So this was a, almost like a tennis match between you, wasn't it? Yeah. 
So when we were asked to write the book, that's such a pompous phrase, and I really apologise for it, uh, but when we were asked to write the book, uh, we did say that the only way we'd be able to write it is if we could kind of try and replicate what we do in the podcast, which is absolutely no preparation ever. It may surprise you. <laughs> uh, so, so Jane and I didn't tell each other what we were writing about, and we had this uh, writing process where we would send each other our chapters because it's a kind of call and response thing. So every chapter, one person writes it and the other person responds to it. And we had a deadline, didn't we? Can you remember the deadline? 10 o'clock, wasn't it? it? 10 o'clock on a Monday morning. It was. Yeah. Where we had to send the stuff that we'd written for our chapter and then the other person had to write the response without really thinking about it. So you, you literally just read it and go, oh, I don't think that's right. And blah, 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 off we go. Mm. So, because we just wanted to try, it, it, you know, it's not a very formal book and it's not a self-help book and we're really not telling anybody what to do. It's just how we feel about some things that we believe to be important. Mm. And we actually managed to do that, didn't we? Which I think we were surprised well, the fact about. That was a, a lockdown at the time. And I think it was, we wrote it in the January, February and March of 20. 21 there wasn't we didn't have many options did we actually no um, it was uh, lockdown three everyone's least favorite lockdown yes the really bad the grimmest of the lockdowns yeah. but who knows um and so it was actually really i, I found it a, a, a place of sanctuary actually to, to sit and actually get this done and i would look forward every monday to seeing what fear come up with and i look forward to trying to come up with a really speedy and genuine authentic response to what she'd said did you um, ever have the conversation of look there are things that we are not going to put on the table there's stuff that we're not going to talk about and if you love me you won't take me there for God's sake. well i don't think neither of us want to drag each other's you know offspring into into anything so that, that the children although they're acknowledged were always going to be off limits I mean, my kids are 22 and 19, and their, their level of interest in what I'm up to is... is, is I would say it's quite low. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, um, fees, fees are younger and still at school. And, you know, uh, the thing is, no... I mean, the, the book we would never have written is a guide to parenting. I mean, I, 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 am, I am actually astonished that people do oh. write guides to parenting. Why would you do that? Well, also, um, there's always a chapter in a guide to parenting about how impossible it is to find time for yourself. And it's just like, well, don't write a fucking book. About <laughs> Spend some time with your kids. Go and have a how bath. About that? I just think anyone bubbles. looking for a guide to parenting, just talk to my mother. She'll tell you a million ways of doing it wrong. It's just fine. I can rent her out reasonable, <laughs> reasonable rates. Um, friendship, though. I mean, you're, it, this works. This whole thing works because, I think, of your... Real lovely, gritty, groiny, you know, it's textured good. friendship. We are right? quite competitive with each other. Yeah. Well, it should be said. There's that's nothing wrong with a bit of health. So how does that? How does that sort of Jane manifest? Jane wins. That's that. <laughs> that's but how, how does that work? Sort of. Well, I mean, we do like each other. That's uh, Fee really makes me laugh um, a lot, and I think she's a brilliant writer, and I think she's incredibly articulate i find that really irritating she's annoying. um hey, yeah she's annoying. more she's more articulate than than what i am <laughs> i always grew up thinking i was pretty good with the old words and then you come up with someone you know, come yeah. up against someone who's actually a bit better no not really no you are a little bit just a little bit <laughs> um, so i find that irritating but we have a we have a lot in common uh, yeah. as well which is also um also really good and um well, i think we the, the fact that we've done this together is something that I'm, I'm genuinely really proud of it. And I'm proud of the fact that we put we did put a certain amount of effort in, didn't we? We did. Yeah. We yeah. Did. And and I think it's uh, I think for both of us, our go to place can be one of, uh, you know, self deprecation. Mm. And and that's not a um, now you said I'm articulate. I can't think of no, anything. No, no, this is just ruining that. Really can't yeah. think of anything. But can just, one of the problems with that is, if you're, you know, I was born in 1964, and you know, I'm 57, and I, I'm not supposed to be a show off. You know, we, we were not brought up to to blow our own trumpets, or we were brought up to work hard and to be fastidious and clean in our habits. And you know, I'm from a a lower middle class background and I was it was very important to my family that I was respectable and that I continue mm. to be respectable there was a, I wanted to write a chapter um, in the book called if Boris were Doris <laughs> and, about how Doris Johnson let's do that now yeah. well, should we let's just, do it now well, just, yeah. how does it start well yeah. we, we think we have a fair idea that Doris probably wouldn't have been able to do some of the things that Boris oh. has has been able to do 
Uh, and I suppose he is my sort of go-to person, born in the same week as me in 1964. Wow. Um, I mean, who, if anyone had known that a Prime Minister and a future Woman's Hour presenter... <laughs> <laughs> the stars were aligned. Fireworks have been going off across the nation. Um, you know, and he's from a very different background to my own, and I think he has, he carries with him, I'm going to say it, a certain amount of self-confidence. <laughs> um, which, which I haven't been blessed with. Do you know what I'm getting at? I know exactly what you're getting at. But yeah. do you think eventually that uh, <clears throat> self-confidence is going to be the failing of him whereas Who actually you might your lack of your your lack of self-belief uh, might actually be something of a, a victory in the long run but I do you know how weird so. it is for a lot of people to hear that you don't have self-confidence the pair of you i mean isn't this weird do you not find it as weird as i do well i think do we you need think to... it might be bollocks <laughs> Do you no, think? <laughs> no, so I think we do need to clarify it because no, you're, no, and you're absolutely right to pick us up on it. Yeah. So neither of us are shrinking violets. Mm. Both of us have chosen a career uh, where you know we we have the courage to open our mouths <laughs> and speak for a living, and both of us are really happy to have a kind of public persona. So you know we're we're not the quiet people at all. But I think what is absolutely true. And, and I would say this of so many women, and perhaps it's just that men can't yet articulate it, and bless them, welcome to our world, you know, don't be shy about it. I think it is a female, and it's a good female trait, to not believe that yours is the only voice in the room, the only opinion worth having, you know, the person who's going to end the sentence, the cadence in life. You know, I like women for exactly that reason, and I don't want us to have to change that. I'd rather men came over to us rather than us mm. go towards them. And some men do. Don't yeah, they you? do. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're incredibly fond of about three men. <laughs> <laughs> Two of them are Sean Keedney, to be fair. The other, one, yeah, the other one's my son. <laughs> OK, so. there we are. Um, can, I, can I just ask you to, to maybe dip into the book? Because I'm just fascinated in, in baby Jane, <laughs> baby Fee, and sort of, you know, you've got advice in your book about things that you wish you'd known. Oh, OK, so when we're doing the young. reading Do, do you now. mind doing, doing that? Just, just, we, you know. We're very clear, we're not giving life advice. No, no I know. Neither, neither of us. Know. By the way, I've but got my COVID pass here, just in case <laughs> anyone's wondering. <laughs> If Thank you want you to much. QR code yourselves in all the way around. Do you know what? I spent hours doing all of those things and because I've come back from a little holiday in France. Oh, God. Very lucky, I know. Have. Um, but you still, they say on the website you have to do the letter d'honneur, yeah. which is just such a hilarious thing. What is a letter d'honneur? So you have to, so it's a letter from the, from the French government mm. available on their website that mm. you're meant to carry with you at all times in France, where you basically just promise the French that you don't have any symptoms. Oh, upon my honour, yes. I have not done this. Oh, yeah. right. But it's just so delightfully old-fashioned and pointless. I mean, <laughs> who, who's going to get out the letter and, you know, on an hourly basis, check whether or not they are... Do you think if they find out you lied, there's a duel? Yeah. Right, are we doing reading? Yes, do you, you want I'd me to that. do the... Yes, yeah. I'd love that. Okay, You'd like so that, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, good, right hands. I haven't brought my other glasses with me, so they're very focal, so I have to do that to get to the bit down at the bottom, so I'm sorry about that. It looks a bit strange, doesn't it? Well, there's no need to laugh quite so loud. <laughs> <laughs> I felt that was a bit cruel. It's, it's a little bit. They're young. It's nice for you to come. Uh, right, so this is just a little chapter. It's in a list form, and it's called uh, Things I Wish I'd Known Before Leaving Home. I'm pretty sure that I ignored anything my parents said to me between the ages of 15 and 25, but if those same words had been told to me by literally anyone else, then I might actually have listened. So here is a list of the genuine things I wish I'd known before leaving home at the tender age of 17, released like a dove in a Bonnie Tyler video into the wind machine of life. <laughs> I might as well leave it here because I suspect my children will be ignoring it. Number one, don't leave home at 17 if you can help it. Spend as much time in the proving drawer as you can. The final bake will be better. <laughs> Number two, if the chicken smells off, it probably is. <laughs> Number three, if he smells off, he probably is. And number four, if you smell off, go and see a doctor. Number five, most of the time it is sensible to do what that doctor says. For example, always finish the course of antibiotics. I had a simple, albeit painful, 
uh, tonsillitis in my 20s. I didn't finish a course of antibiotics and I went back to work within three days. I ended up with a Quincy tonsil. And yes, that sounds Dickensian because it is. It resulted in a doctor having to pop it open with a scalpel. I know. <laughs> Shall I go on? Imagine the exorcist and you're there. I was in hospital in Dundee for longer than I cared to be. I've got nothing against Dundee. It's a delightful city, the birthplace of Lorraine Kelly and the resting place of the discovery. But I don't live in Dundee, nor did any of my friends. <laughs> Number six, while we're on the health thing, for heaven's sake, learn some first aid. Don't be one of those people who didn't know what to do. You don't have to train to be a St John's Ambulance team member, but why on earth wouldn't you learn how to save a life? Number seven, read Ann Tyler. I can't quote great chunks of her wisdom or even name her characters but I know that all she's written about relationships and family life has stayed with me and informs many of my decisions without me realizing it. Number eight, lovers will make you high, friends will make you happy. Number nine, never sacrifice the latter for the former. Number 10, while we're on the love boat, if he, she says he, she loves you within a week of meeting you, it's probably love that he, she loves more than he, she actually loves you. <laughs> Beware of the lover who loves love and good luck with that sentence. <laughs> uh, number 11, I'd say give drugs a swerve, at least until they're legal, it won't be long. And in the meantime, if you wouldn't buy your mints from a bloke on the corner of London Fields, why would you buy anything else from him? <laughs> Number 12, no one really cares about cellulite apart from you. You can't even see it most of the time, so is it really worth worrying about? Number 13, avoid changing rooms with mirrors where you can see your cellulite. <laughs> Just on the off chance that number 12 has started to bother you. Number 14, have you ever, and I mean ever, not liked a, friends of your, a friend of yours because they've put on or lost a few pounds? Did you love your parents, aunts or favourite teachers any the less when they got wrinkles? No. So please don't lay that judgment on yourself. Number 15, hugely important one, don't reheat rice. Or if you do, <laughs> reheat it in a microwave until it's like tiny pellets of hardened uncooked rice that appear to be ined inedible. Then they will be inedible, and this method makes sure you throw it away. <laughs> Number 16, if a pair of shoes is too tight in the shop, they'll always be too tight. Walk away, sister. <laughs> Just walk away. Number 17, ask lots of questions, then actually listen to the answers. Number 18, and I wrote this before all the Boris stuff, saying sorry feels good as long as you mean it. Saying sorry when you don't mean it will turn you into a pain. Number 19, get pets and look after them well, it will be worth it. Number 20, don't get houseplants, no matter how well you look after them, they'll die and it won't have been worth it. <laughs> Number 21, parking fines don't pay themselves. Number 22, avoid peach snaps. Number 23, the expression first impressions count is bollocks. I have close friends who I couldn't stand when I first met them. <laughs> And I now love them. Some people get nervous when they meet people for the first time. Some people are just having a rubbish day. Friendship is like feeding broccoli to a three-year-old. You do have to give it at least a couple of tries. <laughs> Number 24, kindness is next to wisdom. Find kind people and stay close and possibly consider being the kind person yourself. And finally, number 25, the saying, a change is as good as a rest is bollocks too. Often in life I found sleep is exactly the answer. This chapter is short because I'm going to have a kip. <laughs> I mean, it, it's so glorious, and you're going to have to buy the book to hear Jane's reply to it, which is also hilarious. Just one bit from her reply is, if your house plants die, just get new ones, you twit. So you get you sort of the idea. Of I think it's worse than that. Well, I've, 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 de I've developed a keen interest in house plants. Well, we know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't mention it. But if you had given that advice yes. to your 17-year-old self... By the way, I do think, I mean, Fee, you did leave home at 17. Yeah, you did. You did. did. Can I just say, that, that is too young. Yeah. You know that was, well, it was too young, wasn't it? <laughs> No, it was fine. Are you all right? It was fine. You're okay. I mean, 17, yeah. No, but, I mean, if you had said any of these things... To yes. Them, what was 17-year-old Fee like? Oh, obnoxious, uh, ridiculous, uh, wearing a, such a thick mask of, you know, I can take on the world whilst underneath just flailing. Uh, would I have taken any of that advice? No, I mean, that's the point, isn't it? I mean, you know, you tell your kids all of these things that, you know, this this ground-up wisdom that, that's been quite painful to achieve. And, you know, they're just on TikTok or, you know, obsessing about the fact that Harry Styles only released a single, not an album. That's been a source of tragedy in our house last week. So, no, you just, you don't listen. And that's the, 
you know, it's mm. the never-ending cycle of life, mm. isn't it? You left at 17. You didn't leave much later. 19, was it? When did you well, leave? Well, I went to university at 18. But, right. uh, but I was a very um, unworldly nerd. Well, tell, tell, us about, tell us about Baby Jane. I just like calling you Baby Jane. <laughs> please, please, please not like no, no, calling you that. It. Slightly worrying. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, I was very, very innocent, uh, very keen on Echo and the Bunny Men. Had a coat, a bin man's coat from Millet's. Um, felt felt very, <laughs> very strongly about a lot of things. Right. Um, very much had the view that I probably wouldn't have much of a life because the apocalypse was coming. Yes. <laughs> um, and I wrote a lot of, of very depressing poetry along uh, that sort of theme. <laughs> so you, Freshers' Week was a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember saying to people, well, I don't know why you're, why are you so happy? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky if we get to the end of the week. Um, but do you know what, Jane? Mm. Neither of us can lay claim to the fact that we wrote a letter to President Gorbachev. Oh, sh Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's have a little bit of Anita, because Anita's oh. double fabulous. Oh, no. No, oh, please, just quickly tell that story, because oh. it's so... It's oh, so... Can you keep it very brief? So ashamed of myself. <laughs> um, I... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, when I was um, uh, just first at university, I started working for the student newspaper and I thought that what it needed was an interview with Mikhail Gorbachev. Because <laughs> it's what every student needs to read. So I, I, I knew he was coming to London. So I wrote him a letter which started, Dear Mikhail Sergeyevich, we have a lot in common, you and I. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we are. And can I just say, my really awful brothers read that out at my wedding. I know, that's how I know it. Still it's not we were there. speaking to Do you not remember them. that we were there? I do remember <laughs> that you were there. I do remember. I also remember Peter Allen. Do, you, do, do any of you know Firefly Peter Allen? Yeah. He was there and he thought it was a dry wedding for the first half hour and was in absolute you're agony. You're absolutely right. <laughs> he was having a terrible time. He came time. over to me as he, and, and he sought my counsel on a number of occasions about all sorts of things. Do you think there's booze? Do you think there's going to be booze? Do these people have booze? Well, that's, that's sort of what he meant. <laughs> there was lots of booze. Yeah. We're Punjabis, there's loads of booze. It was yeah. a great wedding. It was one of the best weddings I've oh, ever been to. Oh, you gorgeous. Yeah. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, which leads us to your reading, which I'm, I'm equally, equally thrilled oh, um, sure uh, to yeah. hear, because it's about something I just think is so true, which is even though... Um, I mean, I think, I think most of my women friends are perfect. I think, I think it's, it's wonderful and I think they're really, really supportive. But I know in me, certainly, there is this thing where even though you want to be really sisterly, you want to be a real sister, you think that you're doing all the right things, there is this one little judge, judgy bit. Mm. And you never even want to name it because you're so ashamed of it. And you just write about it. <laughs> you just say, actually, this is what we do. And, and read it because I think it's brilliant. And it just made me sort of think, oh, God, yeah, you're right. Well, what I've tried to do here is to acknowledge the side of myself I like the least, mm. if I'm honest. But but it's a very real part of me. Mm. And it's that snivelling side of, I'm going to say a lot of women, and of course a lot of men too, but I'm a woman, um, that does mean that I do read the Daily Mail mm. and that I do sometimes thoroughly enjoy... <laughs> yes, I'm going to say it. I, you know, <laughs> we all know that even those of us who don't read the Daily Mail do read the Daily Mail. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, um, I've just remembered something out the, the Daily Mail once called me a crop haired feminist. <laughs> Did they? Did I mean, they? They may, what they mean is we think she's a lesbian. <laughs> right. Uh, so we'll go with that. Right. We'll, you know, we'll stick with it. I mean, just, you know, God, they're unbelievable. Anyway, um, <coughs> do, I, do I studiously ignore everything the Daily Mail? No, hmm. no, I don't. So I've just got to be completely honest about it. Anyway, um, because I, being authentic, I have used as my reference points. Uh, sort of the soap operas of my youth, which is kind of where my thought, thoughts went. So um, we were sort of immersed now in the 1970s, if you can come with me to this place. In Soapland, many a plot was driven by the woman in a fake fur coat with attitude to spare and what we all knew to be the burden of a reputation. Men did not have reputations, or if they did, they were always accompanied by a woman saying, oh, don't mind him, it's just his way. Lots of the female characters in Coronation Street had reputations, but my early favourite was Vera from Crossroads. If you weren't around at the time, you'll need to be armed with some basic information about the show and a willingness to suspend your disbelief. 
Here we go then, and don't say you weren't warned. At a time when I doubt Britain had a single actual motel, Crossroads... <laughs> <laughs> Crossroads was set in a top, possibly four-star, Midlands motel. <laughs> Close to that region's dazzling motorway network. It attracted a range of guests, both shady and sophisticated, and it was Vera's fate to be attracted to many of them. It's fair to say a good many suitors hopped on board. Miss Vera Downend, she would never have been a muz, was the Crossroad motel's hairdresser who lived and loved on a houseboat. Vera, played by the wonderfully named Zeph Gladstone, was a foxy brunette, I should emphasise, but otherwise she exactly fitted the ne'er-do-well bill. Wiki now describes Vera, to my shock, as a tart with a heart. <laughs> and I suppose it's true, Vera's suitors came and then they went, sometimes with better hair because she was a damn good hairdresser. <laughs> When I got home from school, homework dispensed with in 30 minutes or less, I'd immerse myself in the messy affairs of King's Oak, the Midlands. <laughs> and even my pea-sized brain was receiving some important messages. You could be a Vera. You could live in wacky, alternative, water-based accommodation and have a string of lovers between bubble perms and blue rinses. But chances are you wouldn't find yourself sitting pretty at 65 with hubby safely tucked away on the golf course, something unctuous in the slow cooker, and the prospect of a couple's only river cruise up the Danube <laughs> hoving into view. <laughs> oh, these wrong and women like Vera had spectacular flurries of excitement, wild peaks of ecstasy, troughs of despair, brimming with confidence and sometimes almost predatory. They may fleetingly have had a better time than the rest of us, but there was always a price to be paid. They got candlelit steak dinners and trips away. But you knew there'd be no big white wedding for the saucy minx who led the gent astray. He'd no doubt go on to find lasting happiness with a handily placed local virgin, while the hapless <laughs> vixen died toothless and alone in a filthy hovel with only a schooner of gin for company. <laughs> the hovel would definitely be filthy because women of that sort have very low hygiene standards. <laughs> If her hovel had a <coughs> fridge, and I accept it's a big if, she would not bother to clean behind it. My adolescent self was beginning to get it. Women, it seemed, had some choices to make. Do you want to be one of them, or one of the other sort? Stuck on your houseboat, waiting for a debonair car salesman called Lance or Vince to pluck up the courage to leave his missus? Or a contented life in suburbia, with decent, dependable Brian, someone who knew his way around loading a dishwasher? I could be a woman people talked about, or a woman who talked about the women people talked about. To be fair, the chances of me flouncing through life as any sort of temptress already seemed remote, even in 1980. I think that dream finally died the night I saw Debbie Harry fronting Blondie at the Deeside Leisure Centre, standing on tiptoe on soggy squares of carpet on the ice rink. She was unimaginably beautiful, a pop goddess, simply luminous. I was 15 in a Marks and Sparks ski jacket with contrasting dark and light blue panelling. <laughs> squinting. Squinting because I hadn't wanted Debbie to see me in my NHS glasses. This meant, unfortunately, I couldn't see her very clearly, but <laughs> I saw enough to know when I was beaten. Atomic, Union City blue and heart of glass, my fists were clenched with both excitement and fear deep in the pockets of that ski jacket. <laughs> this was power, and it felt dangerous. Power in a raw, pulsating, uber female form. Centre stage, her hands on her hips, looking us in the eye, daring us not to be captivated. Power I would never have. Oh, it's just gorgeous. Gorgeous. You see what I mean about them writing in their own voices? It's, it's kind of miraculously true to, to who you two are. The, there's one phrase that kind of leaps out, you know, the kind of woman, uh, women talk about. You have both been talked about, haven't you? And I'm sort of, if you don't, I mean, if you don't want to, we don't have to talk about it, but you've been in the papers for s ridiculous things about divorce. Which is a really difficult thing. I say I've been in the talk papers about. about other things. Um, <laughs> I don't remember any of those. Oh, well, oh, no. <laughs> what was the one about? Uh, oh, um, baked not baked Alaska. Um, what was the pudding? I was really rude about. It was. It was. 
it was Arctic, Arctic Worms. Arctic Worms. So they know. Yeah, thank you. They know. Well, yeah, yeah. So I've been in the papers for Arctic Worms. Yeah. But does it, do you know, shall, shall we talk, because I know you've spoken about the, the divorcing and you're, and you're very keen to say, you know, so what, up yours, which I really like. So, I mean, just let's talk about that, shall we? Well, let's yes. talk about divorce. Shall we? Uh, so, Jane and I have both been in the papers uh, because of our personal lives. I and mean, not as much as... You know, no, not not huge amounts. But, but enough to be really annoying. Yeah. yeah. And if I'm honest also, it's upsetting, isn't it? So I think it's more upsetting than you think it's going to be because you you know, you do live off this diet of knowing other people's private lives and then when it happens to you, there's a kind of like, yes. oh, that's, that's how distasteful. And you have to remind yourself you're part of the problem. Uh, but I think what we try and write about in the book uh, is both of us are very keen to not be determined in other people's eyes by our relationships, you know, be they successful or unsuccessful ones, because it's just, ir it's just irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It really is irrelevant. And I think both Jane and I, and I don't want to speak for you on this at all, but uh, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think both of us are very keen to normalise divorce, uh, more so for our children than for us, and also because the sheer statistics uh, mean that there are more children of divorce and separation in this country than not. So how absolutely absurd that there's still some kind of... a. Uh, uh, a morality attached to it, a shame attached to it. I mean, it's really not a news story if a relationship hasn't ended in the way that other people, or even those people themselves, wanted it to end, and everyone's fine. Mm. I mean, what's, you know, what is the story yeah. there? Mm. So we write quite honestly about divorce and the annoying judgment of other people, but also in an attempt to actually have a really much better conversation about how separated families work, because that's the really helpful bit, is just all being able to talk about which bits work, which bits don't, which experience is worth hanging on to, which bits not. That would help everybody. It would help people make better decisions about marriage, you know, let alone better decisions about divorce. And for our kids, I don't want my... And, and the funny thing is, I don't think my kids do carry with them uh, any anything like the kind of shame <coughs> that possibly... I carried with me as a child of divorce. So we're moving in the right direction, but we're not moving quickly mm. enough, I think. And women do still get it more than men. So I think if you, uh, you know, if you did a survey today of the most mentioned men in the newspapers, uh, I think, I mean, apart from the obvious one, our dear leader, uh, I think most of those other men, you wouldn't really be able to know or talk about what their marital status was, but with women, you always do. Mm. And I think that might need to just shove off the stage as well. Mm. Would you agree, sister? Yeah, I do agree. And I also, I kind of try to make the case for single parenthood in my chapter of, of the book on divorce, because I actually think, for me, and this is a very personal thing, and it isn't a criticism of, of my former husband particularly, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's another book. Um, no, it's, it's the fact that I found being a parent as a, uh, on my own easier. I, as soon as I knew that the buck stopped with me, a kind of enormous weight fell, fell from me, and I just thought, OK, well, who's going to do this? Well, I am, <laughs> and I'll be doing it tomorrow, and the day mm. after that, and the day after that, and a curious calm came over me. And, um, and it's, I, I, but, but that's not to say that, I mean, I've got, most of my friends are very, very happily married and they're in great marriages and they're bringing children up very successfully. And sometimes I look at that and I think, I wish my children had had that, frankly, that looks great. And I can see that it's, you provided a wonderful cocoon and it's no mean feat to stay married. And I really admire those people who do because God, I know it's not easy. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that both people have got to be prepared to make compromises and, you know, there's a, there's a price to be paid mm -hmm. somewhere along the line. No one has it 100% easy. But I do think that I've found single parenthood uh, uh, often a huge laugh. And, you know, I've spent hours, weeks on my own with the children and, and obviously they're women now. And it's, you know, I've got out of it what I put in and um, it's been good. You know, it's been 80%. 85%, maybe even 90% good. That's lovely. Not easy, mm. but mm. good. 
Mm. And so I just, I wouldn't want any woman or man to think, oh God, you know, this is going to be terrible for everyone. It's going to be terrible for the kids. It's going to be awful for me. It, honestly, it doesn't have to be. The number one bit of advice, if anyone is remotely interested, and I know I've said consistently we're not giving advice, is always big up the other parent to the, to the children, you know, that never, ever, ever say anything about their mother or father that is going to cloud their judgment because mm -hmm. they weren't married to them. You know, he's their dad or, or she's their mum. So, and I think, I think I've stuck to that. I get it. I'm going to take my some... kids are in prison. <laughs> 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 they, they, they're two each and two of the most lovely, lovely kids each, actually, that anyone, I mean, anyone could hope to have. Um, I think we could take some questions now. <coughs> I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions. Now, we've got two ways of taking questions. We've got uh, lovely people at the back with a roving microphone. So if you're going to ask, there we are, two gorgeous people at the back with roving mics. If you have questions, could you put your hands really high in the air? And I also have technology. So I'm going to, all of you guys watching uh, at home, I can take questions. Fee, um, sorry, Fee, B, it looks complicated it says click here to view them okay I'm doing that can't see anything right real life questions <laughs> are there any real life questions otherwise you're gonna have to hear me wanging on because I've got millions of questions anything at all oh dear there we are there Ooh, we are hooray. officially my favorite audience member right there <laughs> oh no you're wonderful thank goodness you're here Hi, thank you so much for this evening. It's been really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of your discussion on divorce and relationships, uh, I recently got married, and what would be your advice for a newly married woman? Oh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <guys. laughs> well, first of all, congratulations. Yes. <laughs> um, it's lovely. Advice, I think there's more for you, Felix. <laughs> Gosh, I just wouldn't dare to give you any advice. I mean, every marriage is, you know, is its own, it's its own little ocean liner on its own cruise to its own destination. So I think you just, you got to feel. If you're what certain, did you just say? I don't know. <laughs> what? It's not one of those cruises where everyone gets norovirus. Is it? <laughs> God, where the not. ship sinks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. No, just enjoy it. I mean, you know, presumably you're. You're very, I, I mean, I can't ask you this really. You're happy to have got married. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, that's a start. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and I'd just, in, in, you know, just enjoy every, every moment of it. And when it gets difficult, which it inevitably does, uh, you just got to stay true to yourself. And if it ever gets too difficult, you see, this is the terrible thing. You're going to ask, uh, you're asking advice of two women who for whom it became too difficult to stay married and you know that's that's why mm. we are both divorced uh, but but you know we are happy to be divorced so i suppose that would be my only piece of advice if it ever didn't feel that you know it was <laughs> this is dreadful <laughs> stop 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 now <laughs> okay. what, what um, no no what star sign are you <laughs> No, congratulations. I mean, you're in the very much the first flush. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, I mean, are you having discussions about who's taking the bins out or how, that sort of thing? Oh, we didn't have to have that discussion. That's the kind of thing he does. Oh, he just no. does it. He just does it. Oh. He's a keeper. Yeah. Yes. He certainly is. Well, no, that's wonderful. That's a very good sign, isn't it? The bins. Very, really, very really good Can sign. Can he make risotto? <laughs> Oh. Does he reheat rice? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll have an absolutely magnificent marriage. Yeah. And it'll all be wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Let's, uh, let's take any, uh, uh, another question over here at the front. see us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just one, one bit of advice. So whenever we're having, sometimes we argue uh, quite a lot, and, and um, he always says this one thing, which is just so lovely and just takes the rage out of me, which is, I'm your best friend and you're my best friend. Just remember that. And you're like, oh, God. <laughs> so that's quite nice. If you can still feel like you're each other's best friend, that's quite nice. And that ends the argument in your house, does it? Yeah, well, I just... I stop. <laughs> 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 Moving on. <laughs> Stay on here. Okay. I suppose this is a partly an observation uh, and a, a very welcome one, is that it's such a joy to hear two women talking 
as we do frequently listen to you. Um, and I can't imagine, really, a situation where we would get two men talking in the same frank, open, honest way. Um, what a lovely thing to say. I can pass you on to my husband. No, that's really kind. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll tell you what, madam, would you both be able to answer this lovely lady's question <laughs> about how to stay married and enjoy it? <laughs> Patience. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm glad you, that's really, it is a really nice observation, and thank you. And I, I think w the difference between radio, and we, for, Fee and I have done a lot of very formal, structured radio programmes. Of course. We certainly have, of course, yes. Um, and that's what's so wonderful about the podcast form, she said, sounding like an absolute idiot. I'd like to take that back. Um, is that we have been allowed to just properly talk to each mm. other. And it's pure, it's just, we, we talk to each other with somebody else in the room recording it. It's a very weird way to earn a living. And I have to say, <laughs> it wasn't how I imagined my career would, would pan out. Did you think it would be as successful as it is? Well, no, no, it is. no. They just needed a couple of women to do it. The BBC quite literally was you know, looking around for a couple of women and they knew they needed older women to do a podcast. Mm. And we were just sitting there and <laughs> <laughs> cluttering the place. Let's, let's give these two a whirl. You know, nobody expected it to be. But I, I, you know, I think we do. It is actually quite authentic, the conversation that we have on the podcast. It isn't rehearsed. We never discuss before we do it what we're going to talk about. Mm. We do sometimes disagree with each other and we do share elements of our lives that, um, well, have allowed other, the listeners, to join in with their own experiences and observations, which has been brilliant. And, and as a regular listener, I've noticed that actually, I mean, it's it's not, it's the demographic is wide. It is. Have. I mean, you've got, yeah. Wide, yeah, sort yeah. of over, I mean, over the lockdown period in particular, you had a lot of young women mm. saying, you know, I was really lonely. Thank, mm. thank you for and being And we're massive there. in Western Australia. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. You. Yes. You. But, but actually, um, to, to also be serious for, for a, a moment, I think uh, part of the reason for its success is nothing to do with it being Jane or me talking. It is literally your point that it proved to be very rare, you know, we, mm -hmm. to hear normal conversation between women. Because I think women in broadcasting have had to ape a kind of male way of talking uh, because that was what the status quo was so you know both jane and i were probably in our other jobs on other programs much more uh, possibly a, a little bit more aggressive in interviews or authoritative or that's probably the wrong word straight backed a bit more formal i don't think we ever felt that we could talk how we normally talk um, and and, and that, I think, I hope most women in the audience would agree, is what keeps us going, is, is talk, isn't it? It's, you know, we, we wanted to be um, gender determinative about it. That's what women do really well. We can just veer off and take the profound to the profane and all the way back again. Yeah. So it was really lovely to be able to do it and to prove to be a success because there were a lot of people at the BBC who didn't think we'd last longer than 12 weeks and didn't think that, that the way that we talk was important, and now they do. So mm. that's a really... Yes, they're taking quite an interest thing. in us now, aren't they? They've taken an enormous interest in us because we're backed up by statistics. And You've, got numbers. Numbers. You've got numbers. You've got numbers. 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 And I think um, it's, it's actually vanishing into memory slightly, but the lockdown, you know, it was really frightening. We have all been through a really odd and disturbing time in our lives, and I think maybe none of us are fully aware of just how miserable we've been or I mean some people in this room will have been through extraordinarily terrible and sad experiences over the last couple of years and some of you will have proper jobs in the real world where you're actually really exposed to some terrible things um, but there were times when I would I would be desperate to talk to Fee on the podcast every week during the lockdown because we were both doing it from home at that point mm. and it was a bit of a mental it was a lifesaver it wasn't was it? it was a self-help group of two yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, not just really two. I mean, we were all there with you. So it's, well, yeah, it's, it's lovely. I, you know. I think I would have done it anyway. Mm. I think I would mm. just have done it. Well, that's called cool, just having a friend, isn't it, actually? <laughs> <laughs> but darling, it helps that you're paid. It does. It <laughs> doesn't hurt. Um, <laughs> there's a question over here. <clears throat> oh, can we just get a you microphone could just over there? Just pass it along the road. Yes, 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 we yes, can. I'm sure. I've, but they may not at home, so why don't we, why don't we just get you on the microphone anyway? 
Hello. Um, first of all, thank you very much for keeping me company most evenings. Um, I feel like I know you personally, and of course you don't know me at all. Um, I was late, fortunately, and I'm listening in sequence. So I'm currently, as of last night, in week 11 oh, of lockdown, oh, which is really super weird. Oh. So I wanted to ask, in relation to lockdown, what have you taken from that experience and carried forward for now? Um, for example, my local shops and the local veg guy in Hampstead was an absolute mainstay. He was joyous and happy and fabulous and meant that I didn't starve. So I now go to him rather than go to the supermarket. Really simple stuff, but is there anything that you took from lockdown? I can't believe she just talked about the fudge bloke in Hampstead. Well, <laughs> I'm trying to be a bit more diverse in this <laughs> And it ain't happening, is it now? I can't believe we've got listeners in Hampstead. <laughs> And just one last point, whatever kind of day I've had at work, you've always, always grounded me and made me laugh, so thank That's you very much. Indeed. Oh, thank you. That's a nice thing to say. Gosh, what I have we taken had a great from lockdown? answer to that question, and I haven't really. I suppose I... I no, I'm not any calmer. Um, <laughs> no, I'm a lot less calm, actually. I suppose there were times... I mean, I don't know. I was thinking the other morning about... The t and it was about this time a couple of years ago, wasn't it, on the morning that Boris Johnson was really, really ill. I mean, really mm. ill. And... Um, I was doing Woman's Hour, and um, they decided, I don't know why, but they decided the mood of the nation was, you know, genuinely people were fearful oh, for very good reasons. And so as a sort of emergency, we rang Mary Berry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, it sounds funny, but this is true. This is not, not an answer to your question. It's just an anecdote. Um, <laughs> And it was almost like, sort of, you know, she was behind a glass and we just had to, you know, it's an emergency, smash it, get there again. <laughs> uh, and so she came on. There was absolutely no rhyme or reason to this at all. And um, we talked about how to make a simple tomato sauce. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mary. It's just <laughs> lovely to talk to you. And it, indeed, it had been. Mm. Uh, but the response we got from the audience was just, you know, that's just, I just wanted just to Just needed hear. that. Mary Berry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway, it's not an answer to your question, but... Um, oh, anyway, it's a brilliant answer. I, 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 what would you say you've taken? You'd Do you know, I really wish that there was a long list of things that I've changed, but um, I have I wash my hands more. <laughs> <laughs> That's I really a long do. time coming. <laughs> yes. uh, I, I've rushed back into normal life to try and not have to think about how different and bad it was and just embraced all of those things that I used to get a bit frustrated and pissed off about like a you know flogging to a supermarket to do shopping um, after a day at work and and rather you know relish the the kind of familiarity of it and I don't think it's changed me enough at all actually but I think something might happen to all of us much further down the line because I think it's quite a natural human thing to just want to get back to what you know so I don't think we'll actually realize uh, quite how bad it was and how much it has changed us for a little while mm. longer. And certainly, um, I mean, there are other periods in history. Jane became obsessed by the Spanish flu during mm. the early pandemic, which, which you'll get to in about episode 294. <laughs> <laughs> the standby for that. Where, <laughs> where you became a bit obsessed by what the experiences well, were after the Spanish flu, so we could use those experiences to inform us now. Mm. But as it turns out, there's really very little record of that because nobody wanted to talk about it. Mm. If they'd survived, they just wanted to get on, get on with it. And I think maybe that's us now. Mm. Well, and also, you know, there are so many distractions. I mean, many of us have just come back from the Costa del Covid. Uh, you know, there's war in the net. Have we, have, have, you know, have people lived through times like these? And are women better suited? Well, of course, people have lived through times like these, but are women better suited to dealing with this? Not with our hormones, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what do you mean in the sense of being able to compartmentalise? Yeah, and just, power, you know, separate. I mean, you, because you did an amazing thing. So, I mean, I, I'm sort of aware because I do know both of you that there are things that, that we've had conversations. I'm trying to think of them in the book or is it a conversation? But it's a conversation we had yesterday that you've actually taken Twitter off your phone because that's the way you're going to cope well, better yes, with it. I, so. I'm, yes, I've become a, a bit of a bore on this, like a Catholic convert, but I have taken Twitter off my smartphone. Mm. And I am a significant... Well, you kept it on your burner phone. <laughs> 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 You've completely ruined it. Cause I, 
actually, Fee and I have got a bank job later on. So now, <laughs> now it's not going to happen. Um, so I, um, I am a significantly happier and calmer person. Mm. I've had 10 days now without scrolling through Twitter. And I haven't posted on Twitter. I haven't looked at Twitter. And I am going to have to, for professional purposes, probably use it again at some point in the future. But I, I tell you what, this is an absolutely honest answer. At one point, the week before last, my phone screen use average across the week had been six and a half hours a day. Oof. And that's, that's like a teenager, Jane. It's pathetic. Yeah. And I'm, I'm actually, I was almost sick when I saw it. Mm. And so I just thought, okay, I, I, this has got to stop. So today I bought a pair of shoes on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I am using the phone still, yeah. but I'm not... At the moment, there's so much terrible stuff going on mm. in the world that you don't know what Twitter is going to show you next. And you can see this horrifying image from, from Ukraine, followed by some catty observation about the size of somebody's bottom. Mm. You know, and you just think, I c no, I can't, I can't do this anymore. So um, we'll see how long it lasts. Could you? Yes, what, uh, do you have sort of coping strategies that I don't know about? Oh, about. Uh, Carver. <laughs> uh, so, well, I've dialed down all my internet use for exactly the same reasons. I'm just not, I don't feel resilient enough to be able to deal with all of that imagery. That, so I've never been an Instagram user anyway, but even on Twitter, I can't cope with seeing the body of a dead child mm. and then just go about my daily business. And part of that, it's not just the shock of seeing that horror, it's the fact that uh, we, are, we seem to be impotent to change that war at the moment. And I just find that the, really impossible in my head to try and, and deal with. Because, you know, uh, you can open your home to refugees, you could be vociferous, you know, we both have a public profile, we can say things that we want to say, but it's still not going to change a mad, mad fucker in, you know, destroying, the, you know, in, intent on destroying so many people's lives. And that thought, you know, that just spirals from one tiny image, I can't cope with having that all mm -hmm. the time. So I find that incredibly difficult. But your point about women, I think, is a really interesting one because, you know, the women and children who are leaving Ukraine at the moment, so many of them are going to be widows and children without fathers, aren't they? Uh, you know, they don't, maybe don't even know that yet. And so the resilience that mm. women are going to have to show in a foreign country, uh, you know, for possibly decades mm. ahead is just almost unimaginable. But I think it would be... Surely it wouldn't be a good time in the history of the world to start, you know, saying it's men versus women again. You know, we have to have a better understanding of all of those, uh, of those two different positions because it, it must be, it is hell on earth for the men in Ukraine being yeah. separated from their family yeah. and the resilience that they're showing is there too. So I think it would just be a slightly easy strike to go, you know, mm. we're all women together and we'll deal with it better. I don't think anybody's going to be able to deal with it well. Mm. It's going to be hard to make a gear change out of that. I can do it. If someone can do it. I can it, do it, can. I can do it. Has anyone, got, has anyone got a question? We have got a question right there at the back. On oh. the screen. Oh, there's one on the screen. Well, I'll tell you what, let's get the human first and then I can't <laughs> see her. OK. Sorry. Um, is this, can, can I? Yeah, sorry, I couldn't hear my voice. Um, the first thing is that I love how much your podcast is such a celebration of female friendship. Um, Sorry for my nervousness, I um, don't normally like public speaking. Um, and the second is um, how much fun you make wi being women seem, and that's so exciting for me. I'm 25 and me and my twin love your podcast. I guess my question, don't worry, it's not just a statement. My question is, um, although you claim not to be a self-help podcast or a self-help book, I think you've been really good at teaching me how important it is to say, you know, when, you've, when you're wrong and that you're sorry, and you do that quite a bit when you read an email that, changes your view on something and is that a skill that you've had to build up over time because it's <laughs> my biggest weakness and I really admire you both for it. Oh, lovely, well, lovely, 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 lovely. Thank you very much. So lovely. Yeah. Um, we do, we do, tr it's interesting you pick up on that because some people think we apologise too much. I actually, I don't think we do and I think we are often wrong and sometimes we, I remember we missed George Floyd, didn't we? We're not, you know what I mean? We, we didn't reference it quickly enough on the podcast. And we realised we hadn't referenced all that terrible stuff quickly enough. And we discussed it. And then before that, we'd... I mean, I'm to blame for this. I had this 
I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, but as an adolescent, my crush was Prince Andrew. Um, <laughs> This is just true. I mean, it's just nothing we can do about this. And I've got, I've got diaries, five years' worth of diaries. Uh, why are you all laughing? Then, well, I'm just laughing because a number of women with their heads in their hands oh. in the audience. Because I, I suspect I wasn't alone, actually. Well, no, and you took the piss out of me on the podcast because my crush was Elton John. Yeah. <laughs> but you win. It's the winner now, baby. <laughs> Because I've actually got a... And he, well, the thing is, for about six months, Prince Andrew was really attractive in the late 1970s <laughs> and early 90s. And there's a picture of him in the inside cover of my 1979 diary, which is hilarious, the whole thing. But, um, but we used to joke about Prince Andrew and about my crush on Prince Andrew. And this, this, our podcast started in 2017. Mm. We knew about Prince Andrew then, and I was still thinking it was OK to make these sorts of remarks about this man mm. um and so we've discussed that too on the podcast so we do have form in at least acknowledging genuinely my inadequacies <laughs> as we as we've gone along and i think we're a bit quicker now to react to stuff i hope yes yep um, but also i think it's such a it's such a lovely point from a from a younger woman about being able to hear people admit they're wrong because mm. it's just it just is quite helpful isn't it it just makes it it, it, I think it just makes it easier. And just going back a bit to that point about how women used to have to be in broadcasting, I think it would, it would just have been almost impossible to, you know, say, no, I've got that bit wrong and I'm not very good at that. Mm. You know, we had an armour on us that, that, you know, where we had to send out the signal that we were always right about everything. Yeah. And it turns out we weren't, and it's mm. much easier to just admit it. And most of the conversations that we have with listeners do start from them saying, I don't think you're right about that. <laughs> mm. And then, you know, we get to some kind of happy place eventually. So it's nice that you notice that. And also, it's amazing that you're listening to us. So thank you. We, uh, we appreciate... Uh, you have no idea how delighted the BBC would be that a 25-year-old woman <laughs> is listening <laughs> to a BBC Sounds podcast. It will mean a great deal, won't it? It would, yes. In fact, I'm dashing back there now to tell everybody at <laughs> Broadcasting House. <laughs> Um, um, because, sorry. No, I was just going to say, if there, there is a question here. I'm not getting it. So do you want to read it out for me, B, if you, if you can see it? Do you just not... Yeah. Um, please say happy birthday, No. <laughs> that is really not a question, but OK. Happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. OK, I, I've got it. I've got a... I mean, I'm, we're sort of running out of time. If we've got any more in the audience, just put your hand up. There we are. There's one here and there's one here. So let's get as many as we can in. Sorry, we, we're just deliberately geographically challenging you with this. And there's one online um, from Sally. If you could murder someone and get away with it, would you? Oh, OK, while well, we're coming to the lady oh. in the store. If you could murder someone and get away with it, that's an outstanding uh, that's question. That's a great question. The answer yeah. is no. <laughs> oh, I'd do Putin in. I'm very happy to go in. Yeah, under, under the guise of being a you know, very short, middle-aged woman, I think I'd be able to get away with it. <laughs> no one's going to suspect me no. of, uh, of anything. Uh, yes, I'd take, I'd take him out at the moment. No That's problem. a brilliant question. Um, over here. <laughs> How do I follow that? Um, you mentioned earlier that you guys don't have a lot of confidence, which for me was quite a surprise. Um, you, like during my PhD and even now as a scientist, it's really clear that us women have a lot less confidence than our peers. Mm. I know some superb PIs who just don't have the confidence of the males who are exact same level as them. We all feel that we're about to get found out and it's all a big mistake. Um, so I'm wondering like, how you guys do live radio to the nation. So if you don't have self-confidence, like, how do you do it? How do you go about like, kind of combating that? It's 99% bullshit, to be honest. <laughs> I do think you sort of have to learn to bullshit, don't you? And that yeah. just power through. Look at a man and look at the way, not all men, I mean, some men carry themselves with that extraordinary degree of confidence which is to be admired. I mean, it's an amazing life skill. Now, whether they're born with it, whether they acquire it, whether it's their mother's fault, I suspect it probably <laughs> is, actually. Um, I, I don't know, how do, how do they do it? And why, you're an amazing, intelligent, accomplished woman. I think you have a PhD from where I'm about to graduate, from Birmingham. I do, yes. I do. So mine, can, can I just say mine is an honorary? <laughs> <laughs> own it, sister. I should own it. Yes, why am I apologising? Yes, I've got a PhD. <laughs> but, I mean, I, to go back to something I was saying earlier, I, we, on the whole, and I've got two daughters, I, I don't think we bring our daughters up to be bullshitters. 
And I don't think we like them if they display those characteristics. And I don't think their peers like them. Mm. And I don't think boys like them either. I mean, is that, do you? No, no, that? I think. And I, yeah. I think it's, it frustrates the life out of me that you are in any way doubting yourself. And perhaps we should pack in saying things like we don't have confidence because I'm not sure that's really the message. I don't, well, I, know, I, I also, I think, I think, I don't think it's true. I think you have, I think you've gone through maybe stages of not being confident, but I think you are such supreme craftspeople now in what you do. You don't even think about it. Yeah. I think you just do it. I think if you thought about and it. And it would be disingenuous, you know, you know to say that true. we don't have uh, oomph, because obviously we have to have oomph to even do something mm. like this tonight uh, but but radio is odd because you you are in a dark room on your own you don't you don't feel uh, I think such a, a, a an immediate kind of pressure of scrutiny but in your job you probably do you know you're presenting to people in a room mm. you're asking people to you know to mark your work and to listen to what you have to say you know we're slightly kind of megalomaniac in what we do because we just open the microphone here we are it's I mean it, I think it is easier but maybe it's just helpful simply to know that lots of other women experience the same thing and what's the worst that could happen you know the worst that could happen is you say something that not everybody in the room agrees with or you know you don't leave the room uh, feeling that you kind of owned it I mean so what you, mm. you'll still be fine so I, I wish you well. I mean, Jesus Christ, you're a scientist. You're doing something valuable for the world. We are chatting for money. What? Yeah. So, <laughs> you know. Please don't say that. <laughs> what, what, what's your PhD what in? I just want to say this, because I really feel quite in, uh, incensed. Um, you do not bullshit. Men bullshit a lot. <laughs> but no, you've acquired uh, a talent, mm. uh, uh, you've yeah. a skill. You're middle-aged, you've got life experience. Do not say you... I am not middle-aged. <laughs> <laughs> I, I fully intend to live to be 180, so I'm therefore the foothills of youth. No, I, I, take, I take your point, and I, I, I think... Mm. By, the, by bullshit, I meant it's about acquiring that superficial... slightly superficial sheen of confidence, which mm. isn't actually real. But if it carries you through, who cares? Mm. No-one else knows whether it's real or not. Yeah, so and it's not bullshit, it's just not having self-doubt or the kind of self-doubt that stops you from being yeah, able to do something. Yeah. And maybe those of us who've got daughters need to encourage them to be more like their male peers and not to berate them if they appear to Why be can't we just be, say to them, be more like you two? I mean, let's just stop saying be more like male peers. You, you've done great things, you know, you've done great things in radio, you've done great things in a sphere where no one thought you would. You've written books, you just own it. I mean, I think people with daughters just say, be more Fee and Jane. Yeah, I think that would be. Doesn't work with my it? daughters, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's take one final. I think that we've got time for one more, have we, Fee? Okay, brilliant. And there was a question over here. There we are. Sorry, lost you for a second. Let's get the microphone to you. Great. Thank you. You have a very wide range of guests on your show. How do you choose them? Uh, Is there an element of choice? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, gosh, well, there's a long answer and a short answer. I'll do the short answer. You can do the long answer, senior partner. Uh, the short answer is uh, Jane and I don't, uh, don't have much to say. We do get told who we're getting. And w we are in quite an interesting position on the podcast where <laughs> we don't get first dibs on the guests. Uh, that goes to more important programmes on the network. But as a result, <laughs> we get very interesting people sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> years after they've been very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we welcome them all. Madam. We get the vintage, vintage interesting people. Yeah, no, it's, that's a very, very good question, and I wish I could honor, on, uh, honestly answer it, <laughs> but I can't quite. It's so random. We yeah. don't really, we don't really understand uh, how we get the guests or why. And sometimes it's definitely so. We had Anne Tyler, our all-time favorite guest. I mean, just you know, one of the one of the planet's best writers. And I swear to God, I think her her agent, so, you know, Sam, our producer, had just phoned up and said, uh, it's the BBC, uh, and forgotten to say it's a tiny podcast <laughs> an offshoot of radio 4 which is just a radio station that's part of the bbc so sometimes we luck out and you know she said yes and she came on and other times oh, i don't know What's no, the process? i mean sometimes someone i was just thinking of the astrophysicist maggie, maggie adair in pocock was on relatively recently and i loved having her on because she's just 
fizzes with energy and she's so clever and she just knows so much stuff about a world, worlds that I know nothing about. So people like that are delightful and that's wonderful, but sometimes, let's be honest, we're lumbered with a bit of a dog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do we all want to know who the dads no. are? <laughs> No, no. Name them, name no, them. I, I think when someone's on and we make constant references to the fact they also have a podcast on BBC Sound, you, know, you do get anything, yeah, I think, I think we know. Yeah, and sometimes I think you can, if you do listen uh, to, to Fortunately Regularly, I think you can tell in the way that Jane and I say to each other, who's our guest this week? <laughs> Because it's a little bit... We keep being promised Hugh Edwards and he just seems to fade further well, and further. Well, no, but he did get in touch, didn't he, on, on the socials yeah, yeah, with both of us. It's quite flirty on yeah. the socials. and he said... Uh, he, he, he said that we were a deeply menacing pair. <laughs> <laughs> but that he was going to come on. He is going to? Yeah, yeah well, well, but he's not shown up yet. Mm, okay. so. Well, I, I think we, we've run out, but I've got time for one of my questions, which is um, if, if Alison Pearson were to resign right now, and the Daily Mail offers you lots of money to take on a column. Would you do it? <laughs> nope. 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 Oh, that was a short answer. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do it, no, but God, I'd be tempted. <laughs> but Honesty I'm... always. Honesty always. Um, thank you both very much. Thank, thank you for your brilliant thank questions. You. No, thank, and thank you, everyone at home. Thanks very much.